For our opening prayer, I just wanted to mention two more things. One, it's nice to see college students back. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you guys again. Um, and the other thing is I've been on vacation. Now, well, two weeks ago I was. Last week I was in quarantine. But um, the front uh, photo here is of a Lutheran church in uh, Schwentenenzel, I probably am saying that wrong, in Germany where I was. And that's where my friend got married. So if you're looking at the photo and thinking, what is that? That's... Um, it's the front altar area of the Lutheran church I was in, and it was really moving to be there and to see a, a church overseas. They spoke entirely German, so I was completely lost the whole time. But um, 
It was really just beautiful to be in a house of God somewhere else. So, and you'll notice they don't have a big cross on the wall. It's the Cairo. It's the sign of, um, was it Constantine, I think? So I thought that was really interesting. I'd never seen a church that has a Cairo at the front rather than the cross. So really neat. <laughs> Open with a word of prayer. Holy God, we come before you on this Sunday morning. We ask that as we enter into this time, that you prepare us for all that we are going to hear and receive. May our hearts and hands be open to the gifts that you are ready to give us. May we take this time of nourishment, physically in the communion, but also mentally and emotionally in the fellowship, and help us to mirror that out to the rest of the world as we go back out of this place today. Amen. Our opening hymn is Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. You'll find that on 400 in your hymnal. seated. Our call to worship, um, I made a typo, it's from Psalm 14, but it's still on 746. It's not the most cheery psalm, but I think it's important to read it. So we'll read it responsively. I'll read the light print if you read the bold print. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. The Lord looks down from heaven on all people to see if there are any that are wise who seek after God. They have no knowledge, the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. He would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Before our scripture readings, we have a unison prayer 
you'll find that printed in your bulletin. Would you read that with me? Holy God, open our ears to the readings of your holy word. May these words transform our hearts. Amen. So our first reading is from Jeremiah. I will remind you that this is the weeping prophet. So again, it's not the most cheery passage. At my first church this morning, our lay reader uh, missed the second part, forgot to read 22 through 28. So they missed the most spicy passage here, but you will not this time, unfortunately. So it comes from Jeremiah 4. At that time, it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a hot wind comes from me out of the bare heights of the desert towards my poor people, not to winnow or cleanse, a wind too strong for that. Now it is I who speak in judgment against them. For my people are foolish, they do not know me. They are stupid children. They have no understanding, they are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to do good. I looked on the earth, and lo, it was waste and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no one at all, and the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and lo, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolation, yet I will not make a full end. Because of this, the earth shall mourn and the heavens shall grow black. For I have spoken, I have purposed. I have not relented, nor will I turn back. Our second reading is a little nicer. It's from 1 Timothy 1, uh, 12 through 17. I believe this is Paul to Timothy. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I have received mercy because I have acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ah, we also sang Amazing Grace at the previous church. So that's what we're singing today on 378. You'll find Amazing Grace.
you. You may be seated. I think that might be appropriate after reading the Jeremiah passage just to hear that there is grace. It's a very good thing. So our gospel reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 15. This is Jesus telling more parables. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to you, Lord. Okay, I see we have two kids. You guys want to come forward? I have a message for us. You interested? Okay, all right. So we're doing an exercise today. So if you remember what we just heard, there's a lady who had silver coins and she lost one of them. So I'm gonna give you each a bag of silver coins and I want you to count them. See how many silver coins are in each bag. You can open it up if you want. <laughs> Might be a little tricky, the small bags. I wish I had something for you to put them on, but. <laughs> oh. Hey, if you want to put them out on the book, that'd be a good idea. I'll have you count them and see how many you have. So you should have 10. How many do you have? have you have nine. How many, you also have nine. Okay. So what do you think you want to do? Do you want to stick with your nine? Or what if I told you there was one coin for each of you hiding up there? But you had to leave those coins here. But there's one coin that's hidden up there. Do you want to take a chance and take those back? Or do you want to try and find the coin? Find You're going to try and find the coin. Okay. So you have to leave your bags and coins here for now. See if you each can find the coin up there. You found one? Hey, you're pretty good at that. Cool. <laughs> so he found his coin. You have one too. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> you're getting warmer, I think. A little bit like Easter egg hunting, but a little trickier. <laughs> I told you, you're warmer over here. Did you guys find it? <laughs> That's right. I, I still have that. <laughs> Oh, you're really close. You're really warm. 
try by the wooden uh, table, I guess. <laughs> Yay, found, okay. So now go back and see if your nine coins are still there. <laughs> All of your coins? Okay, all right. So now you have your 10 coins and you're welcome to bring those home with you. That's a story that sometimes it doesn't seem right to leave nine coins to search for one, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. Because now all your coins are together. All right, so thank you guys. I think you did the right thing. So I'm sorry I had so many coins. <laughs> Thank you, Marsha. <laughs> okay. We have a coral anthem here.
So if you are used to me, my preaching, you might think, well, will she go with the Jeremiah passage because it was disturbing and she'll want to break it down? Unfortunately, <laughs> I went with the Luke passage this week. So if you're wondering what's happening in Jeremiah, there's probably some commentaries on it, but I can give us a bit of context. Uh, Jeremiah's around the time of the Babylonian exile, and so he's one of the ones, I think he's one of the last prophets um, before that. So he's probably referring to some of the ongoing destruction or the upcoming destruction at, this, at that time. So I'm going to look at the Luke passage, though. Before we do that, I have a hypothetical situation for you. So let's say, this is back a number of years ago for you now. For some of us, it's probably close to 50 years ago. You're at a close friend's birthday party, and you're about 12 years old. So you know that most of your friends are going to be there, and a lot of stuff has happened for you over the last year or so, so your friend group has grown pretty close. There was a lot of changes happening around the age of 12, and you find that you kind of stick together in a tight group. Um, you don't want to be seen as different. So you're invited to your friend's house, and you guys are anxious to find each other there because you know as soon as you find each other, stick together, get through this birthday party, have fun. So you and your friends arrive about the same time, and you're greeted by the parents. You say, hi, hi, Mrs. So-and-so, and you kind of keep your eyes downcast, but they're nice. The parents are nice. They give you goodie bags, and you rush them with your friends, and you find a corner of the room to rip open the goodie bags and see what you got. And then you look up and look around, and you notice someone is missing. <laughs> so you're sitting there thinking, who is missing? And you're counting, you're counting six, and you're like, well, there's seven of us. The birthday boy, the birthday boy is missing. So you and your friends go to his room, and he's not in his room, and you go around the house, and he's not in the house, and you're thinking, where is Luke? <laughs> so finally you go to his mom and say, where is Luke? And she says, oh, he's outside. And as you go outside in the back area with the picnic table, there he is sitting at the picnic table with the next door neighbor. And you think, wait. The next door neighbor is a year younger than us. He's not part of our friend group. And the next door neighbor comes from a neighboring country. So his English is a little strange. And so you're th sitting there thinking, why did Luke abandon us, his best friends, to sit with the next door neighbor? And you start to feel a little mad. So this leads me to a question. Is, was that fair? that your friend would abandon you guys, your close-knit group for someone else? Maybe not. And I start to wonder, I know I've asked this question before, is God a fair God? And I ask that question fairly often because I think it's an important question. It kind of affects how we see our church, it affects how we see our community, it affects how we see ourselves. If you're ever describing God to people, if you have somebody that you go to and say, you want me to tell you about God? <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, I don't do that very often either. Or somebody says, why are you a Christian? What do you like about God? What do you say? You say, well, God's all loving and all knowing and powerful and God's merciful and God's good. And we use all these terms. We have these Christian terms. You say, God is fair. I don't, usually. I think in the last couple of years, I've gotten used to the idea that maybe God isn't a fair God in the same way that we think of fairness. I can't really order God around by saying, well, I think this is fair, so you should too, God. God works a little differently. So if you like biblical examples, I'm haunted by the passage of the Syrophoenician woman. <laughs> The woman who's chasing after Jesus, saying, heal my daughter, heal my daughter, and he looks at her and says, is it right for me to take the bread for the children and throw it to the dogs? <laughs> All of us Christians are like, oh, that passage is really uncomfortable. Did Jesus just call this woman a dog? <laughs> and you're thinking, does that sound fair? And what is her response? She says, yeah, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the children's table. And Christ says, yep, because of that faith, you're healed. Your daughter is healed. So there's something weird there. I don't know if we'd call that fairness. I think, honestly, we live by the Code of Hammurabi a lot closer than we 
listen to God, <laughs> we like the eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's straight out of the Code of Hammurabi. We like revenge movies. <laughs> we like going to the theaters and like, yeah, another revenge movie. I personally can't stand them, but <laughs> I'd, we like the idea of karma. Goes around, comes around. We love that. And we know that God gives, so we're waiting for God. But like, well, in case you don't get to it, I want to get back at them first. <laughs> Yikes. We're told not to do that on earth. We're told something radically different by Christ. Not you get right back at him, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Christ said, if someone wants your coat, give them your shirt too. <laughs> it doesn't sound fair. If someone strikes your cheek, turn the other cheek. <laughs> that doesn't sound fair. I think we live in a time that likes guaranteed repayment, deed for deed, rather than waiting for God. And even if we wait for God, what does God show us he'll probably do? He'll pull a stunt like he did in Luke 15. <laughs> Leave the 99 and go for the one. Is that fair? It leads me to wonder, who provides for life on earth? If we have so much control, if we have so many good ideas on what's fair and what's right, then are we the providers for everyone on earth? No, no, all of us would say, no, we are not the providers for life on earth. God is the provider. We say God provides for those in need. We say that often, we believe that. And I think on good days, we say that. Does it mean that we can't help? No, we're supposed to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. We're tasked with feeding and clothing and visiting, caring for. We're also tasked with that. But the main thing is, is that God is providing, and God provides to those who need it. God isn't aiming to give to those who already have enough. And maybe that seems wrong. Maybe we say, well, if we look at the world, the richer are just getting richer and the poorer are getting poorer. Who is being provided for? But I encourage you to try not to think in those cynical terms. <laughs> Look for the helpers in the world. Try not to say, I'm just going to generalize it. The richer are getting richer. There's no justice and the world is terrible. Try not to overgeneralize. <laughs> Look for the helpers. Somehow, over 100 years ago, there were a group of people in this neighborhood who decided, we want to build a church. And they got together and built this building, and then built every single church in this area, in this small, <laughs> probably like a three-mile radius, there are so many churches. And to think that all of these people just took their resources and time, the gifts they were given, and made this space for all of us today. God is providing, and even helping to provide for those in need. And then you start to wonder, does that go against our way of living? If God's providing for those in need, who wants to provide for those in need if you can't control what they're gonna do with what they're provided? For instance, if somebody comes in and says, I want $20, and you say, yeah, but what are you gonna do with that $20? <laughs> we always wanna know what they're gonna do with it. Who wants to provide when there's no guarantee that they're gonna use what you've provided for good uses? what you see as a good use. We say, you have to work hard to earn hard. You've got to work for it. It makes us crazy when people get something without earning it. Did you earn that? We say, did they need that? Are they just being lazy? They're on welfare. Did they really need that? We are kind of cruel sometimes. I wouldn't have done that at their age. Sorry. <laughs> It doesn't really help that there's a stigma around government assistance. We think those getting help are often lazy. It's sad. So maybe it would make sense that we're bothered by the idea of the shepherd leaving the 99 and going after the one, because that isn't fair. Those 99 are loyal to that shepherd. It's the one who's strayed off, and he, should he gets what he deserves. He's strayed, his problem. They say it isn't fair that the shepherd left those 99 for that one. The 99 are loyal. But life is confusing. <laughs> life in this world is very confusing, and life is a precious gift. Life is full of hardships, but it's also full of celebrations at the same time. 
I think of like a funeral service is one of the hardest things we're going to have to go through, but it's also one of the most joyous things to see all your family and friends there and to know how deeply your loved ones were cared about. Sometimes the same event is at once a source of really heavy sorrow and a lot of joy. So I have some questions. What is more worthy of celebration? Somebody getting what they deserve or somebody receiving mercy? What is more worthy of joy? Somebody getting what they deserve or receiving mercy? Somebody being brought into their true life, somebody saying, whoa, this is what I was made for. Or the idea of God giving them what they deserve. <laughs> I thank God that God is not fair in my eyes because I think the world would be a lot worse off. God is merciful. And I believe that we are made to want what's good for other people. We want joy. We like joy. We want God to be joyful in his creation. When we come together to worship, it's because we want to be joyful and worship and praise God. If the 99 are faithful, that's great. That's really good. There's 99 faithful people. If there are 99 faithful people going to church every Sunday, I would be ecstatic. But we don't need extra gifts. The 99 don't need the extra gifts. But you know who does? It's the one who strayed. So if I say, does that rob you of joy, I guess, knowing that somebody who doesn't deserve mercy is receiving mercy? The stray is getting special treatment. Does that rob you of joy? I don't think it should, because here's the catch. The joy in the returning one isn't only exclusive to God. It isn't like the 99 are like, oh, so the one is back and now we have to be mad about it because our shepherd mistreated us. When the shepherd comes back with the one, he's carrying that little dude on his shoulders and he's really happy. He says, neighbors, friends, family come together, we're throwing a party. Like the story of the woman who finds the coin, she doesn't just find the coin and then be like, oh good, I found my 10th coin. She says, friends, neighbors, everyone, come together. We're throwing a party. I found my coin. <laughs> you may think, that's kind of silly, because it does sound a little silly to throw a party for finding a coin. But a party is a party. <laughs> it may not seem fair that some churches are getting full-time ministers, and some churches seem to be doing really well, and we're like, we've got a half-time minister, and we're doing okay, but we could be doing better. It may not always seem fair. It may not seem fair that some people are on government assistance and some people are working so hard without it. it. May not seem fair that some families seem to have so many hardships, just one after another, and some families seem like they don't. <laughs> the trick is basically every family has a ton of hardships, just sometimes they're in different ways. But the good news is we're all the church the gain of any one, the gain of any single one person is God's gain, but it's also our gain. It's also the church's gain. When one of our local churches gains new members, we don't just say, how come they got new members and we didn't? We say, praise God, <laughs> there's another person worshiping God. Our church is gained. Our church is not just this church. Our church is the church. You will never meet another person who is not loved by God. Everyone you meet is loved by God. So if we feel that we've been treated unfairly, and we're kind of mad about it, <laughs> take a step back and say, is that a God thing? Do you feel like you've been treated unfairly? Step back and say, is that a God thing? Are we being the grumpy 99? Or, as we didn't read today, but it was the next part of the Luke 15, uh, the prodigal son, are we being the older brother in the story of the prodigal son? Well, dad, I never got a party. And how come you're welcome back my brother? He didn't deserve that. Are we being the older brother? Are we seeking revenge rather than the life of another person being united with God? So maybe a lot of things aren't fair. Maybe a lot of things really just aren't fair. 
but maybe they're right. We might have joy literally right around the corner, and we just don't know it. Having God leading our life is going to help us see the joy, help us receive the joy. So maybe be willing to accept this, that maybe things aren't always fair in our eyes, but God is a righteous and merciful God, and we are welcomed into that joy. So I'll end it there for today. I went a little longer than I thought, so amen. We have the offertory. I'll invite my ushers forward. Graciously accept these gifts, Lord, these tokens back to you. May they be blessed and broken and used not only for our space, but for our community. Amen. Okay. I'll have us turn to page 12 for communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not burned you. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the need of Jesus. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, glory to God.
So we've already done the offering. I'm gonna skip the piece. I've been tempted to do that here, but I'll, I'll do that another day when we have more time. <laughs> so we're gonna go to the great Thanksgiving on page 13. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymns. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Your Son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For all is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of God. Amen. I invite my communion ushers to come forward.
body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Have us turn to page 11 and do the post communion prayer found right before the sending forth. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit, to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In this time, we've been doing prayers of the people, and uh, you'll find that printed in your bulletin. We read that responsibly. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors. For, those who are for this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Bishop Webb, B.S. Whedon, and all bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord. Your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, that your loving kindness be upon them. And our closing hymn is on 381, Savior like a shepherd lead us, uh, one through four.
Our closing prayer is printed in the bulletin. Would you read that with me? Redeeming God, who appointed us to your service, save us from the distress of this life. For there is pain, may we find and be healing. In our service, remind us to go out to find the lost as you have found us. Amen.